Okay, so from last week, we had a little bit of a troubling or a little bit of a hard scripture, let's say, like a, you know, it was, kind of, it was a passage there that was not easy to interpret. Let's put it that way. There has been, there are some, there's some that are like that in the Bible that we run across. Um, so, and hopefully there's no questions about that. So, we're just going to skip it and move right on to verse 18 here. So, it says that, it says, we know, let's just read it all, let's read the last four verses here. It says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come, and has given to us and, and has given to us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from, from idols. Amen. So it's interesting here because in verse 18 and in verse 19 and in verse 20, it says, we know. We know. There's three things, and actually there's more than that, that we know. The Greek word for we know, the word, the word is oida there. The three times that it mentions it there, it's the word oida. And oida is um, knowledge by observation, right? That's what oida, oida is, knowledge by observation. Like we know. But how do we know? How do we know? So how do we know? Because we've been given the Spirit of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We've been born again of the Spirit. And we can say that maybe it is it is it, it is. It is intuition, but it's more than that. It is supernatural understanding that God gives to us. And what are the things that we know? There are three things. Now, number one, that we can say that the power, um, there is power at the disposal of the, of the believer to keep him from sin. Now, it says in verse 18, it says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. And it's kind of a repeat of 1 John 3, 9. Right? Whosoever is born of God does not sin, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. But does that mean that there is people who interpret this and say that it means you won't um, 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 habitually sin? And does that really what it means that you won't habitually sin? Because it doesn't sin that we sin habitually. When we sin, we have Paul the Apostle said he had a certain sin that uh, beset him. So I think that he was sinning, even Paul the Apostle had a sin that beset him. And we all have this about ourselves. What it means is that the new nature, we have a new nature of God. We are born again. And the new nature cannot sin. It's not able to sin because it's always God conscious. So the new nature that we have, we are partakers of the um, divine nature. Second Peter 1, 4, right? We are... That's the verse we went over on Sunday. We are partakers of the, it's his nature. We have a brand new nature. So people, there's people that have this, this idea that, well, I have to try to quit sinning. No, I don't have power over sin. There's no power in my life to overcome sin. But it's Jesus who gives me that power. And so we know. So in other words, number one, there is power. And so, and so I, I should say that this, that the new nature is what enables us to live the experience of not sinning of living not a sinless, perfect, perfected life because we do still have the old sin nature and it's still present within. So we're going to fail, we're going to fall, but thank God, Romans 5.20, it says where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. You know, so it's like, so that's the thing. It's like Jesus, he died to pay the penalty of our sins and if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, 1 John 2.1. So we know that. We have a Savior, Jesus. He saved us, not only from the past, from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. He's saving us presently from the power of sin. And how does he do it? Through the enabling power of, of, the, um, of, of the new nature that's within us. We have this new nature. So number two, it says, um, in verse 19, it says, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. So we're going to kind of skip back and forth here a little bit. We know that we are God. So in other words, the, the, this power that we have to overcome sin is realized by the new birth. 
and is realized by, it is, it is because of the new birth and is realized by separation from the world. Because why? The whole world lies in wickedness. It doesn't just say that the world is wicked. It says it lies in wickedness. So it's a much more powerful statement, you know, than just say, well, the world is wicked. It's what a wicked world. Wicked world, what a wicked world, you know. It's like it lies in wickedness. It's like the whole world is wicked, but we are separated from the world. The Bible tells us, 1 John um, 2.15, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Because if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we become separated from the world. Because why? We are strangers, like it says in 1 Peter 2.11, as strangers and pilgrims. It says, to, to, to ab- he said, like what Paul said, I have... I have I, uh, Peter said, 1 Peter 2, 11, I have, I, that I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which wars against the soul. So we are stra- we're just sojourners in this, like, in this, uh, like, like this life that we have. Our real home is in heaven. You know? So, so, the, so we are, we're not of the world. We are of God. And in verse 20 it says, we know. So it says, it's because of the new birth, we have this anointing from God, and it gives us understanding. It says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. Like, and it's an understanding, this word is dia, dia, dia noia, and it's the only place in, the, in 1 John where that word's mentioned at, dia noia. It's like, this is a special understanding. So, um, and we know that the Son of God has come, and He's the one who gives us understanding. And, what, and that we may know Him that is true. The word there is, uh, this word here is gnosko. It said it's a little different than the word oida. It's gnosko. It means, it means a learned knowledge. And this is what Jesus was talking about, that if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So we learn. We have not so learned Christ says Ephesians 4.20. We learn of him, uh, and we become like him because we become uh, conformed not to this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. You see in Romans 12.2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I mean, this is amazing. So this is a brand new knowledge that we have. So let's, let's back up here. Uh, back up to verse 18, it says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Um, and he that is begotten of God keeps himself. Now, this is what it says in King James, but what it says in the original, it says, He that is begotten of God keeps him. Keeps him, not himself. So what it means is here, there is two people here that are born of God. We know that whosoever is born of God is a, is a perfect tense verb. And then he that is begotten of God is an aorist tense. So in other words, he that is, we are born of God. And we, are, we were born of God in the past, and we still are. That's what the perfect, test, the perfect tense is. And then it says that Jesus, he is the only begotten, that he is the begotten of God. He's the one who keeps us. It is Jesus. And if we look here in John chapter 17, real quick, because I love it how First John is just like, it's really just the words that Jesus, because where did Paul, uh, where did John the Apostle learn this? He learned them from Jesus. These things that he learned them from him. Um, and that's why he was his disciple and became his apostle. Um, and it says right here in John 17, 12, let's back up here, because this was Jesus' prayer, right? And he says, and he was praying for the the 12 disciples. This is, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So in other words, we are kept. We are kept by the power of God until the day of salvation. Right? First Peter 1 Peter 1.5. We are kept. And the Bible tells us the word, the word is, um, fu- uh, the word for keep is phulasso. And it means to guard or, 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 to, or, or to protect. Jesus is the keeper of us. Jesus says he gives us eternal life and we will never perish in John 10, 28. So you know, he, like, and no man can pluck us out of his hand. No man can pluck us out of his hand, not even ourselves, because we are kept by Jesus, our salvation. We are secure in our salvation. 
So this is what this means here. It says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. That is the new nature, but he that is begotten of God keeps him, and that wicked one touches him not. So it is in contrast to the one that is begotten of God and the wicked one who's in the world, that he's the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He is the ruler of this world, the Bible tells us. He is... Um, um, yeah, yeah, he is the God of this world. He is the ruler of this world. And, and, um, and so this whole world is under the influence and the power of Satan. It is. It's like it lies in wickedness. It says that, that in the wicked one, the word here, touch, here, this is an interesting word right here because it actually means to grasp a hold of and um, take, take, um, take control of. It doesn't mean just touch. It means to grab a hold of this word right here in the Greek. It means, so that's what the devil does. And, that, and this is what it means in the Bible. It's in uh, James 4, 7. It says, submit yourselves, therefore submit yourselves to God and resist the devil. You see, this is what it means. That, that because we are in Christ, it's like because we, we can go to Christ and we have his refuge. You see, and now we're able to overcome the power of sin in our life because of the new nature and because of Christ as our example that we are able to because he lived a perfect life. He was without sin and we are found in him and positionally we are without sin. But experientially, because of the new nature, then we can walk in the newness of life, the Bible tells us. We are able to do this now. This is an amazing thing for us. The world knows nothing about this, what you were talking about. The world thinks that, that well, the Christians, they, are, they have a set of rules and standards. They have things that they have to keep. They have to obey the commandments. They have to do that. And it's like, it is not about that at all. It's about the new nature in me. It's about the life of Christ in me. I was, I was not able to overcome sin. Well, what did Paul the Apostle say? He said, the things that I, I, I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing them all the time. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Romans again, you know, so uh, it, it, it's just, it's an amazing thing when we think about this. So this is our new nature that we have. So, we, so that wicked one can, has no power or control because of the life of Christ, because of the life of Christ and the believer. It was like with, with Jesus, whenever Satan tempted him in the, Satan tempted him in um, the wilderness, like, Jesus didn't just quote scriptures. It wasn't just that he quoted scriptures. He lived them. He lived them out. You know, it's like, and so it was much more than that. Oh, I'm just going to quote scriptures and the devil's going to flee. No, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. It's because our life being transformed by, by, by Christ, by God. And the, the, the devil has no power over that kind of a person. But the devil, he's the ruler of this world. He's the God of this world is what the Bible says. So, um, and so in verse 18, it says, and we know that we are of God. And the whole world, that it actually it says that in the Greek, the whole world, just what it says right there. The whole world, not just part of it. I mean, you mean that there, you know, I was, I was looking like how many people were in the world today? Like 7 billion, over 7 billion people. You know, and just in 1800, there was only 1 billion people. So just in this short of time, it has, it has come up that much. And it's like in the world today, it says the latter days, men will depart from the faith, give heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of demons. Depart from the faith. That's what's going on today. The churches are becoming lukewarm. They're, they're accepting things they didn't used to accept before as being okay, which is, well, wait a minute, what does the Bible say? You know, instead of like, well, this is just, it's okay. We can let it slide. You know, we can... We can, we, can, we can have a homosexual pastor. Not a big deal. You know, it's like whenever the Bible is very clear, you know, that it is sin. You know, that we can, we can have a, you know, and, and, this is, and that's, that's just the way how things are going today. Um, you know, and it, says, and it says, and we know that we are of God. The word here, of God, the word is ek, and it means out of. Like we were born out of God. We are from God. I mean, think about that. We are from God. We are not from the world. We're sojourners and we're, we're just traveling through this, this earth right here. Home is our heaven. 
This is temporary time. This is a tent that we live in. It is a temporary vessel that we live in because we know the Bible tells us that, that, that if this building, if this tent was dissolved, we have a building with God, like an actual building, like, you know, like a building's made out of bricks. That's not a tent. That's a structure. You know, that's what it's saying, but this tent right here is going to be cast away, and I'm going to have a permanent structure in heaven, eternal, in the heavens, made without hands. That's an amazing thing to think about that. That's the promises of God. All the promises of God are in him, yea and amen. I mean, this is an amazing thing to think about, you know, that, that God has promised us eternal life, Titus 1, 2. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. God cannot lie. This is a promise. And we have that eternal life now. That's what we're going to be talking about the next, the next three times. We're talking about the eternal life that we have that's in Christ. It's like and we, and we're even talking about it right now. It's like this is an amazing thing we think about that. We've been given these things. God has given these things to us. He has given to us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It's like th this, is, this is what God has done for us. It says, and we know that we are out of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. Not just a part of the world. It's like everything that's in the world. That's why the Bible says to guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23. To keep yourself in the love of God. Jude 21. This is important for us. Because why? Because I could, if, like, if, if, if we set our focus on those things, it will overtake us. It will overtake us. We will be overtaken by it. It's like, it's not just like, well, may it might happen, it might not. The wages of sin is death. It's just like physics. Physics don't lie. You know, it's like you throw something up at the, 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 the same speed that it goes up is the speed is going to come back down. And that's what, that's what God told Eve in the garden. You shall surely die. If you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. The wages of sin is death. But, but you know, of course, the good news is, you know, that Jesus came and, and, and he, he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is an incredible thing that God has done for us. This is the mercy of God when he's removed what we deserve. And then he didn't only just do that, did he? He gave us grace what we don't deserve. And everything that Jesus is, we are. As he is, so are we in this present world. Wow, that's an amazing thing to think about that. Even though that I still sin and still do things, but positionally speaking, no sin. So if I believe this about myself, what if I really believe this about myself? I'm a child of God. You know, isn't that what the Bible says in Romans uh, 6, 17 or 6, 16, it says, reckon yourselves therefore to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Consider it logizomai, I think is the Greek word. Like, could like reckon it. I'm dead, I'm dead unto sin, but I'm alive unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Galatians 2, 20. It's like, wow. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, who died for me and loved me. That's why I have faith, because he loves me. Because a faith works by love, Galatians 5, 6. Wow. I mean, this is incredible. So, um, did I say that this is incredible? I think I did. So, verse 20, it says, And we know that the Son of God is come. You know, it's present tense there. The Son of God, He's come. He's alive. He sits at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. Doesn't say He, he did come. Like he came and then that was it. You know, he died and there was no resurrection. You know, he is come. He presently is alive in heaven. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. This is an amazing thing. Like he, he is our advocate. And, and this is forever. And so he has come. And so, and so this is the knowledge that we have. And he has given to us understanding. Wow. This is what the world doesn't have this. The Spirit, you know, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2.14, he's not saved, not born again, not able to know because of no indwelling spirit, no regeneration. You talk to somebody like that, and I've talked to a lot of people, you know, and even like some believers, and it's, it, I don't know, it's like it's weird. You know what I mean? Whatever like talks to somebody, it's like there's, not, there's no desire is what it is. Because if you desire the things, that what the Bible says, 1 Peter 2, 2, to desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, that's the key. 
is to desire because God is faithful to that desire, to meet that desire. Because that desire comes from God. That's a godly desire that he's given to us. Like, like, like you know, that, that he's given to me that I am hungry and I want to know the things of God. He's given me this understanding. He's given to us this understanding. It's like, wow, that, that he's given us understanding that we may know him that is true. Hmm. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. 1 John 1 5. There is no unrighteousness in him. Psalm 92, I think it's verse 2. There is no unrighteousness in him. It's like God is true, God cannot lie. What does that mean? There's no deviation from him. So, this is what the Father, right? To know him that is true, and we are in him. That is true. It says, even his son, Jesus Christ. Now, the word even here is in italics. And it really doesn't even need to be there. Because what does italics mean? It means that it's not part of the original. And you really don't even have to have it there. You could just say that, that we are in him, in his son, Jesus Christ. So they stuck it in there. But it's like, but so we are in him. And, and we are in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. What does it mean, This. The Father and in the Son. The Father, the Son, this, the God. The, the Father that it, Jesus said, I, do you not know that I and my Father are one? In John 10, 30. It's like, I and my Father are one. Uh, Jesus said, uh, I'm actually going to look at my notes here. John 14, 9. Let's turn there real quick. Uh, 14.8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, I have been so long time with you, and yet you, has thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So this is what is saying that we may know him that is true, that is the Father, and, 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 it says, and, 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 and that we are in him and in the Father and in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. Them. Because Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Christ, and we are in Christ and in the Father. This is an amazing thing to think about. That it says this, this, the, this is the true God and eternal life. Eternal life. You know, and that's what, um, that's what Peter said. There was, Jesus said some hard sayings sometimes. You know, like, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's like, whoa. You know, this dude is whacked out. I mean, some of them thought that. There was disciples, they, they, they decided not to follow him anymore. But Jesus said to Peter, you know, well, are you also going to turn away? And what did Peter say? Yeah, only you have the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life. You know, the, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. That's what Jesus said. They are spirit and they are life. These are the words that he spoke. The things that he said. The, um, uh, the um, centurion guards, they went to, they went, they went, they went to go and arrest Jesus. And then, do you remember the story? They, they didn't do it because they said there's no man who spoke like this man. I mean, that's kind of wild because, I mean, could they have gotten executed for doing something like that? I mean, it was like he must have been really saying something that they had never seen before. And even to the point of being on the cross when he was on the cross and he was, he was loving people up even to that point, being nailed to a cross. And that's what, that was the witness and the testimony that he was true and real, that the life was real, that he was from God. And that's what the centurion said, surely this must be the Son of God. You know, surely. And it says, this is the true God and eternal life. And in verse 21, it says, little children. I mean, he said this over and over again throughout the epistle, didn't he? Little children. They were like the offspring of John because he was their teacher. And he was teaching them truth. 
and they were learning the truth. And this is what it means. It, was, it means like a teacher and a, someone who learns from their teacher, they become like a little child because they're receptive towards the things that are being taught. And they're not proud and arrogant and thinking, well, I know more. No, the little child, they receive. Usually, you know, they receive. You know, not all of them have like a little halo, but, you know, they, but, but they, they, they receive, right? And that's what generally what is little children. You know, it says, little children, keep yourself from idols. Amen. So this is interesting. So what is idol? What is an idol? And the, word, the word, it comes from the word idon, and it means to look at or to see, something that you see, like with your perception. So what could be an idol then? What could be an idol? Anything that blinds your spiritual viewpoint, your spiritual perception, things that get in the way of us. And so that's why the Bible tells us to guard our heart, to, to keep ourselves in the love of God. Because that's what the devil does. He blinds the minds of those that believe not. And so it's, it's more than just like, just like an idol, you know, something that's made out of wood or, or whatever. It's like it, it can be anything. It's like the false conceptions that can engross the mind and obscure the vision of faith. See, it's like, it is like, in other words, like, whatever obscures your vision of faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen so something that hinders you and hinders your growth and hinders your progress from following God and seeing the things and knowing the things of God is like because that's what the devil does he is like we are not ignorant of his devices that's what he does you know um, and so and so we are to guard ourselves against everything that the world would mar that, that, that could, could come against the spiritual life that we have in Christ. Um, everything that masquer, masquerades itself against the truth. It says to cast down every imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 10.4. Cast it down. That's an idol. And bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is our spiritual life that we live, that he's given to us. This is what he's saying. Keep yourselves from these things because they will take you away from the things of God. And it's so easy to do because in 1 Peter 5.8, the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He goes around, you know, just like in the book of Job, right? Like he was going to and fro on the earth. That's what God said to Job. Where have you been at? I'm going to and fro on the earth. He roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's what he does because he's the God of this world. He's the ruler of this world. The Bible tells us. I mean, this is an amazing thing. So, so I think that's it. Amen? So we'll open it up for like a question and comment time. That's amazing. I don't think I ever went through a whole... Did I ever... Have I ever done... I've never preached... I never went verse by verse in any book before. It's always been just messages. So I like it though. It's been good, and we hit some things that I probably would never would have touched on, you know, so it's good. I mean, that's a loaded book, isn't it, First John? Because, oh, because here it is. Okay, so I almost forgot to say this. Okay, this was, I can't believe I almost forgot to say this. So it is like, so here it is. So what it's saying here, like in the end, okay, of the book, it says, this is the true God and eternal life. In other words, what does the Bible say? What did it say in 1 John 1, 5? God is light. 1 John 4, 8, God is love. What's it saying here? God is life. God is life. You know, so um, that, that is like the essence of this book. It is like amplification. You know, if we, if we have his light, we can fellowship with light. We fellowship with God because it's his light. The light comes from him. We fellowship with his love. It's supernatural love, agape love. It's not from this world. First John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, potapos. It means it's foreign, not from this world. And this, and this life that we have, zoe, the zoe life of God, not by us life, not suke life, which is a self-life. There's the suke kos man, right? Who is he? he is a, he's carnal. He's all about himself. He's all about me, 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 me. It's all about me and what I want. And if I don't get what I want, I'm not happy. That's the Sarkikos man. 
you know, the sarkikas, not the sukikas. You know, am I saying it right? Yeah. Su sukikas, yeah. Sukikas, yeah. So, yeah, PSU, it means soulish. Like they're about themselves, you know, because the soul is about me. It's about me, you know. So, but, that, but in Christ, it's like we forget about ourselves. I become humbled, and I forget about myself. And I start thinking about other people, like Jesus did, you know. It's like we become like him. We become conformed to his image. The, the, the world doesn't do that. The world doesn't forget about themselves and start, like, focusing on other people. You know, that's what a church is about, isn't it? The church is about people. It's, it, is, it is a group of believers. And what is it? We are about people. You know, we're not about doing other things. We're about people. That's what a church is. It better be about people. You know, it's like that's what it is. We, we care about people's needs. We have people call on the phone. And, like, they look us up, you know, like on Google Maps. You know, we've got phone, phone, phone calls from Google Maps. And it's like, well, you're a church. You know, it's like, well... Can you help me with this and that? It was like, well, we're really about the Word of God, you know, and we don't have, like, a lot of money and stuff to get people, you know. It's like, but, but yeah, but we can help people to the best we can, you know what I mean? We're not, we're not uh, uh, a um, uh, psychology clinic or anything like that, but we have the mind of Christ here, and that's really the real truth. And if we can think with them, there's where the healing comes from, you know. We, that's where the life comes from. Um, okay, so amen twice. So any, any questions or comments?